Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. When our boys were little, we wanted to be proactive in teaching them about God and the Bible, but oftentimes our desire to have them sit still and listen to a story from the Bible was matched by their desire to be outside climbing trees, skipping rocks, catching lizards. We learned pretty quickly that there were better ways to teach them about Jesus than forcing them to sit on the couch while I read the Bible to them until they fell asleep. We used a little bit of imagination, we borrowed some ideas from some books, and we got really intentional about trying to pass on our faith and our hope to our boys. I remember one night in particular that the boys come walking into the house after a long day of riding bikes and jumping on the trampoline, and it was getting time for dinner, and they were starving. I made the suggestion that since I hadn't started cooking dinner yet, we ought to just run into Winfield and They have a McDonald's there. We just pick up dinner. The boys were in the car and buckled up before I could get the phrase out of my mouth. So we had gone into Winfield all the time, but tonight we decided it would be a little different. As we backed out of the driveway and made it to the end of our street, I took a right instead of the usual left. Trafton noticed it immediately and mentioned my mistake to me, but I told him it was fine. I knew how to get to McDonald's. At the next opportunity to take a stop, I took another wrong turn, and then another one, and then another one, and 45 minutes later, we're still driving around neighborhoods while the boys are in the back seat whining and crying about how hungry they were, and they didn't know why I kept going the wrong way. We would never get there. And just before the tears started flowing, those golden arches came into view. We pulled into the parking lot, and got out, went to the restaurant, ordered our food, and sitting at that table over cheeseburgers and chicken nuggets, I began to explain to them about the children of Israel and how they were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Tristan and I thought it was a brilliant idea, but the boys said that we just made their Happy Meal sad. Our discussion of God's upper story this morning is going to cover the rest of the book of Exodus as well as the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And Honestly, it's an awful lot of text to cover, but in reality, it's basically one page in God's upper story. You might think that the trip from Egypt to the Promised Land was, would be a pretty straightforward and easy journey. I pulled up a map and traced the path, and you would have assumed that they would have taken the shortest route possible. They begin in Egypt, and they would have taken a pretty direct route towards the land of Canaan. Now, if you follow the direct route, you're looking at a route of about 175 miles. Let me put it in a little bit of context. According to gpscoordinates.net, the distance from where we are right now in Anniston to Nashville in a straight line is 186 miles. They say that if we hike that straight line, we can make the trip in 64 hours, which is kind of aggressive because it doesn't count stopping to eat or sleep. But if we average walking 16 miles a day, it would take us 12 days to get there. Moses is leading 2-3 million Israelites, so we would assume it would take them about three weeks. But that's not how it went. Instead, God takes them on a much different path. Maybe you've picked up on this, but God's not a a big fan of the direct route. If you haven't experienced it in your own life, let me give you a little tip that God doesn't necessarily choose the shortest route, the shortest distance. He doesn't send the Israelites by the direct route. First, he sends them down to Mount Sinai. God leads them there so that he can give them the Ten Commandments as well as instructions about constructing the temple. And if you step back and consider what God is doing in his upper story, I think it's easy to understand why God would first lead them down to Mount Sinai. For the last 430 years, the children of Israel have been living in Egypt, and over the generations, the people have become more and more acquainted with the Egyptian culture, with the Egyptian gods. So Jehovah is going to send them down to Mount Sinai because they needed some time to detox. He wants to reconnect with his people before taking them to the promised land. 
And so after a year, they're finally ready for their journey into the promised land. And God leads them by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. It was kind of like their own supernatural GPS. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2, that it takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barna by the Mount Seir Road. Their journey to the Promised Land should have taken 11 days, but we find out that it takes 39 years. It sounds to me like their GPS was constantly recalculating. We love to use the Waze app on our phones when we travel. It's a real-time GPS, and there have been lots of times that it's alerted us to our wreck in front of us on the interstate and told us to get off and drive around, saving us hours. But there is something about Waze that kind of connects with my dark side. I know how to get to Nashville to go see the boys, but because I'm trying to avoid wrecks, we always turn on the Waze app, and as soon as I type in Lipscomb University, this little voice comes on and says, it'll take three hours and 52 minutes to get to your destination. As soon as I hear that, I'm like, I bet I can beat that. I bet I can beat that time. And all of a sudden, I don't enjoy the journey because now everything revolves around beating that time. I want you to imagine how Moses must have felt. They head towards the promised land, and I'm sure he's thinking 11 days, we've got this. Not that big a deal. And then they spend the next 39 years wandering around the wilderness. There's no way he's going to beat that time. Actually, he's going to arrive late. Extremely late. Because God's not going to take them on the most direct path. Because God understands there are some lessons you can only learn on the journey. I think we can best define wandering as living in the space between where I started and where I want to be. It was J.R.R. Tolkien who wrote, Not all who wander are lost. Maybe... Mr. Tolkien understood what was happening in our text this morning. God doesn't encourage aimless wandering. Rather, we discover that God does most of his work in us while we're in that space of traveling from point A to point B. I think for a lot of us, that describes our lives. We find ourselves caught in that space of living in between where we want to be and where we are. We're living in the space between graduating and finding a real job, or we live in the space between dating and getting married, or we live in the space between deciding to start a family and have a child. Maybe you're living in the space between diagnosis and remission, or living in the space of going into debt and getting out of debt, the space of being let go and finding new employment. Most of us don't do well living in that space, the space in between, because, well, honestly, we're not really excited about the journey. Our primary purpose in any journey is to get it over with as quickly as possible so we can get to that destination, get to where we want to be. The journey seems innate. Any parent who's ever had a child on a trip has heard the question, are we there yet? I mean, I've actually heard the question, are we there yet, before we got out of our neighborhood. And so, when the boys were growing up, we used to help them count time by using their favorite TV show. We would say, you have four more Ben Tens until we get there. But they learned early that the journey's difficult. They want to get to the destination, and we're pretty much the same way. We tend to focus on where we're going. We're always in a hurry. It marks our lives and our culture How fast can I get this journey over with so I can get to my destination? We want to try to eliminate as much time as we can from the space between. Because we don't like the journey. We long for the destination. What I'm realizing as we travel through God's upper story is that God's not in a hurry. You remember, he told Abraham, you're going to be the father of a nation. And then Abraham has to wait decades before God finally gives him the son of the promise. Joseph has a dream as a a boy, but he has to become a slave and then a prisoner before he can get into the palace. Moses spends 40 years in a desert taking care of someone else's sheep before the burning bush shows up. 
God's not in a hurry. That's why an 11-day trip ends up being 39 years. What I want you to understand is God is more concerned about who you are becoming than where you're going. And I think that's hard for some of us who are so consumed with the destination to understand. God knows there are some things that can only be learned, only can be worked out in the journey, because wandering is a part of who God wants us to be. Our journey is the classroom where God shapes us into the men and women that can change the world through His grace and through His love. Yet, unfortunately, we all know that our wandering can very quickly devolve into whining. If you know anything that's happening with the children of Israel through the books that we're looking at today, you understand that all throughout Exodus and Numbers, their favorite pastime was to whine or to murmur or to complain. I mean, these people had the ability to to complain about everything. Listen to a few texts. Now the people complained to the Lord about their troubles. That night, all of the people in the camp began crying loudly. All the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron, and the people said to them, We wish we had died in Egypt or in this desert. The next day, all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. They argued with Moses and said, We should have died in front of the Lord as our brothers did. Why did you bring the Lord's people into this desert? Are we and our animals to die here? Why did you bring us from Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain, figs, grapevines, or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. But the people became impatient on the way and grumbled at God and Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert? There's no bread and no water, and we hate this terrible food. The crying and the complaining of the Israelites is constant and it's contagious. I mean, you all know how contagious complaining is in our community. You've experienced it. One person in a family or a couple of your neighbors or maybe a few co-workers or half a dozen people in a church start to complain and pretty soon it, it spreads like wildfire. It's an infection that hurts the home, the work environment, It kills friendships and eats up churches. I believe it was John Ortberg who said, if you really want to change your life, what you need to do is learn four little words. And those words are, it could be worse. But we don't tend to do that. We tend to say, I deserve better, it's not fair, But how would your life change? How would your world change if you just looked at what was going on and said those four little words, it could be worse? I think those four little words can give us some much-needed perspective in the midst of our grumbling and our complaining. Maybe today when you get up and you walk around your house or your apartment, you might be tempted to think, you know, if I had a better house, then I could be happy. If I had more room, I could be happy. But today I want you to change your perspective. I want you to look at your home and I want you to say, God, thank you for this gift because it could be worse. I want you to be thankful that you have a home, a place to lay your head at night. Get a little perspective. The next time you step out of the shower and you make the mistake of looking at yourself in the mirror, you might be tempted to think, huh. I just wish I had her body, or I wish I had his metabolism. If I could be in better shape, I would be happy. But today I want it to be different. I want you to smile, and I want you to say to yourself, it could be worse. Tomorrow morning when you go to your job and your coworkers are excelling in their ability to mess stuff up, I want you to say, it could be worse. When your kids are acting like two-year-olds in the restaurant. I want you to think it could be worse. When you realize that your spouse has made this huge mess in the house, I want you to think to yourself, it could be worse. When you got to go and put gas in your car and you see those numbers just rolling and rolling and rolling, I want you to think it could be worse because sometimes what we need most is to change our perspective just a little bit. 
We need to focus on the blessings, on the gifts that God has given us and quit obsessing over this fact that life is not perfect. It's not fair because it's not supposed to be. The reason this is so important for us is because it's so easy to get focused on the negative that we lose sight of all of the things that we have to be thankful for. Time and time again, we see God gets frustrated with the children of Israel, and I imagine he gets just as frustrated with us. If you're taking notes or if you're looking for a mustard seed this morning, I want you to write this down. Whining is the opposite of worship. Worship is giving God glory for who He is and for what He's done. And whining is nothing more than ignoring who God is, overlooking the ways that He's blessed you. Worship is trusting that God's in control, that He's still writing this upper story at this very moment. But when we whine, we're confessing that we don't trust God or God's ability to affect our lives at all. Whining is the opposite of worry, and our story has to be based on worship, on giving God the glory He's due. People that constantly complain live with this false narrative that God asks for too much or what He gives you in return is not enough for what you gave up. They have this idea that God needs to do more than what He's already done. So we complain and we grumble and we lose sight of who God is and what He's already accomplished in our lives. God sent His Son to be a sacrifice for our sinfulness and brokenness. Right now, He's preparing a place for us in heaven because of His great love. But I think sometimes we get so frustrated because I was going to retire next year and my portfolio is down 30%. Jesus walked on the earth and He showed us how to really live a life of love and compassion. And while that's great, we think, God, I've got these wrinkles around my eyes. I've got gray hair and my hairline is thinning out a little bit. Jesus died on a cross and he took the punishment that we deserve on himself. And we think, that's fine. But you know, God, if I could just have a nicer house or a better car, we end up whining all the time instead of ever worshiping. Our daily response should be to acknowledge who God is and what He's already accomplished, what He's already done. At this very moment, God is holding back the walls to the Red Sea in our lives, and we don't even notice it because we're so focused looking down at the rocks that are in our path. God has done so much for us, the only thing that we should be able to do is worship. We go to the table as an act of worship, as a way of remembering what God has already provided for us on this journey. We take time to look back at all of the ways that God has blessed our lives. We're not under any illusion that our life has been perfect, but we see that God has walked with us through our own dark places. We go to the table and take some time to reflect on this part of the journey. We understand we're living in a broken world, which requires us to endure heartache and pain. But we trust that the one who calls us to the table will give us enough compassion and peace to be able to endure this very moment. As we take the bread and the cup, we take a moment to think about and long for the future. And we trust that our Father will continue to write a story. And each page will be filled with love and mercy and grace. We believe that our part of the story will culminate in the home that he's preparing for us at this very moment. As we make our way to the tables this morning, I want us to commit to striving to enjoy the company of God who is walking with us on our journey, who's writing this upper story, making sure everything works together so that we will have the opportunity to see his face and to stand at his throne and to experience His love and His presence for all eternity. That's why we go to the table, because we want to be with the one who continues to write a story and continues to put us in that story. I hope that you have a wonderful time of communion this morning as you gather around the table, and I hope that in that gathering you remember that God is worthy of worship and praise. Have a wonderful week. Never forget that you're loved. Go in peace. And I look forward to seeing you very soon.